Welcome, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Conversations in Contemporary Art. Uh, this is our fourth event of the 2021-2022 season. Uh, so not yet halfway done. We're in the fall semester still, but happy November to you all. Uh, Conversations in Contemporary Art is run out of the Department of Studio Arts in the MFA program. Uh, for those of you who may have joined us uh, for past SICA talks this year, or in fact last year, this is the second year in a row that we have been hosting these events online during COVID in collaboration with Fourth Space. Uh, SICA as a, as a platform itself uh, has been running since the early 2010s to around 2012. Um, and it's a platform of events that uh, contain talks, dialogues, such as we'll have this afternoon, um, demos, workshops, panel discussions that connect practitioners of various ilks and expertise from writers, scholars, artists, curators, designers, or various combinations of all of those multi-hyphenates uh, with students. Uh, so undergraduates and graduate students, as well as faculty and staff and interested members of the public. Uh, some local audiences, as well as national and international audiences, particularly with the affordances of access on Zoom. Um, I'm Maya. Um, hello. I am the convener of SICA. This is my second and a half year doing so. I've now been convening it more during COVID on Zoom than not. Um, I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Studio Arts, and this ties me to Concordia University and Jojagi professionally and personally, also as a settler educator with ties to Treaty 1 Winnipeg and the Canary Islands. As you might notice from my, my bookshelves, um, although that's not necessarily an indicator of an office, but it is such a typical <laughs> signifier of academia, I am on campus. Um, I'm welcoming you from the downtown campus of Concordia, which is in uh, Jojagi. Jojage is the Genengeha word referring to the break in the waters that cradle this island, um, an island also known as Muniang or Mochial or Montreal. Um, the Genengeha are recognized as the custodians of these lands and waters that are hosting me and the infrastructure that allow me to welcome you into this conversational space. Uh, you may be tuning in from Jojage or further afield. Um, Jarrett, you are in the matrix, but also up the road uh, in downtown Jojage. And we're welcoming Tyrone from um, Dagoronto, Toronto, which is the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. Feel free to share in the chat uh, with everyone where you are tuning in from so that we can keep in mind the infrastructure that does connect us and that infrastructure that is landed. So from uh, Wet'suwet'en and the um, challenges that are happening on Ferry Creek to uh, Mi'kma'ki on the east coast of what is currently Canada, let's keep in mind our accountabilities to sovereignty and the resources that allow gatherings like this to take place and the sovereignty that is important to uh, maintain in regard. Now, as intimated, I have two wonderful guests uh, to, to welcome in. Um, Jarrett, welcome back to SICA. Uh, for those of you who have tuned in to Sika uh, longer than I've been convener, you will recognize Jared as a returning guest. Uh, Jared, you were part of an invitation of a collaboration between Sika and Ear Media uh, in 2018. And this is the first of what I hope will be a reoccurring feature with Sika that involves asking past guests to return and uh, Give us a bit of an update on what you're doing now and to also bring someone from your network with you. So this is kind of a Sika Redux talk. And in the intervening years, Jared, you have uh, joined us as full-time faculty here in the Department of Studio Arts. Uh, you are placed within the concentration affectionately known as IMCA, Intermedia. And in that capacity, you bring an energy of a continuing practice where you, uh, you position yourself as an organizer, as a curator, as a writer, um, based also on the inference of the great resources you shared with us, you are also a reader um, and someone who believes strongly in the arts as a catalyst for social change, as you describe in your, in your bio. So I'm very happy that you could take time out of your semester of teaching and of studio art making to talk with us again. Uh, for the record, everybody, I'll give the extended bio Jarrett's provided in the chat along to a link to his website. Uh, but it's my pleasure to welcome you as, as a colleague. 
Um, and Thank you so much, Maya. I really no, appreciate it. And thanks for organizing everything uh, via email in the pandemic and through it all. Uh, I really appreciate the sort of elegance in which you've um, organized uh, the whole event. Thank you. Oh, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. And it is one of the absurdities where I can welcome you as a colleague, but we haven't yet met in person. However, we are going to go for a drink. <laughs> Um, and that being said, uh, Tyrone, really nice to finally welcome you also um, in person. We made, you know, the awkward social joke just in, before we went live about this being in person, not in person, but most importantly, not via email. Um, and you, like Jared, are a multi-hyphenate uh, curator, also an educator. Uh, you're currently teaching in the criticism and curating program at OCAD. Um, you are also busy involved with planning of the Toronto Biennale. Uh, you were involved in the 2019 iteration and are involved in the upcoming 2022 iteration of that, um, as well as, you know, the reading and writing that you also do. I saw your name on the program of upcoming conversations with uh, Curious Criticism. It's part of CMAG, uh, so I'll be in the audience there. Uh, but thank you also for, for joining us and participating in this dialogue with Conversations in Contemporary Art. And that's it from me. I'm going to shut off my camera and replace it with slides provided by Tyrone and Jarrett. Um, I encourage you all to keep the chat active. If you have questions or reflections, feel free. Um, we will have around an hour of um, listening to the dialogue with Jarrett and Tyrone, and then we'll have questions and dialogue and discussion at the end, leading us up till 6 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you again both, and thank you all for coming, and I'm now going to disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, um, for that really beautiful introduction. Um, and I really, I really love and appreciate your, your land acknowledgement and the way in which you do it. I think that um, it's something that I, I have really been working to, you know, to sort of share with others sort of this, this thinking about the ways in which land acknowledgements, I think in some ways have become quite rote. And I feel like the one that you gave us um, was extremely heart, heartfelt and personal. And I think that's really how land acknowledgements should be. Um, I did want to add to that that you know I am speaking from Takaranto, um, but more specifically I'm speaking from uh, very close to the Humber River, um, which is a place of thousands of years of settlement. Um, there were Seneca villages all the way along the Humber River. It was also known as the carrying place, connecting the lower um, Great Lakes to the upper Great Lakes. Um, so this is a place I'm really acknowledging the fact that I, I'm living, I have the privilege of living in a place um, that has been heavily traveled and is a place of, of trade, but also of connection and community. Um, and I'm thinking about this largely because we're talking about, um, you know, in, in dialogue with, with uh, Jarrett, um, thinking about connections and kinships uh, and thinking about the ways in which we perceive the world and the way in which those perceptions um, are often, um, controlled uh, by forces outside of us and the ways in which I think looking for strategies to, uh, to um, upset, to undermine, to penetrate uh, and to find um, a way of perceiving from a different angle. And I think that's really where uh, we connected, Jared and I, when we met probably about just over 10 years ago, I think at this point, um, and I've really been fortunate enough to, to benefit, I think, a lot from our conversations over the years. I feel like Jared is one of those people, you know, as, as you said, Maya, who is not only an artist, but an avid reader and an avid writer, um, and is constantly thinking about these larger um, sort of concerns um, that I think impact all of us um, within the art world and without. Um, but I think, you know, to, to take a step back and to kind of think about how we connected as, as both humans and as you know, art makers and curators, um, I think we, we automatically found uh, a sort of, we were automatically in sync, I think given our shared backgrounds. And, and for myself, um, I'm of Filipino and um, European descent. And I grew up in East Vancouver as the son of you know, uh, an, an immigrant that really kind of, uh, affected the way that I view the world. And I think that that, I think Jared is something that, that has certainly impacted you 
uh, and thinking about the ways in which you, 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 you look at perception, the ways that we kind of see things from multiple perspectives and are always trying to kind of unsettle uh, the centeredness of a kind of a, of a whiteness that I think we all kind of uh, operate within. Um, but I wanna go back now and sort of start with um, the title of the talk, um, which is on diasporic aesthetics um, and begin there maybe, and, and maybe ask you, Jarrett, what you, how you define the word diaspora uh, and perhaps from there, how you define diasporic aesthetics. Absolutely, thanks for that. Thanks for that really warm uh, introduction as well, Tyrone. Uh, I remember all of our conversations very fondly as well. And I think you're also part of, you know, um, a kinship network as well of, of colleagues and, you know, when, when there's not really a, a great textbook or um, book out there that kind of uh, can help us navigate the world, you, you kind of rely on your colleagues in this whole other way, um, you know, as kind of partners in crime uh, who are navigating similar structures. And we, we learn a lot from each other, or I learn a lot from you, and I learn a lot from people um, of my generation. And I think there's something very specific um, not just of my generation, I, I learned from many generations, but, but there's something very specific that happened for us, you know, in our generation, we're both, uh, you know, born in the 70s. Uh, sorry to out you on that. Uh, but, but there was, you know, a huge influx of migration, um, you know, the, the sort of doors opened uh, in the 60s and 70s for uh, migrants from the, from the global south and my family and I believe your family is also part of that wave. And, you know, growing up in, in Toronto and you growing up in Vancouver at that particular time had its real specific, um, you know, cultural references. You know, you were both, uh, you know, invited in. There was this conversation about multiculturalism. It was a small world after all. There were like Benetton ads. Um, yet at the same time at school, we weren't quite finding, or I wasn't quite finding, anybody who looked like me in any of the textbooks or um, didn't afterwards, even in like seven years of education. So, you know, coming to the word diaspora um, was a longer journey for me. Well, it, it, it was a journey for me because um, I didn't have, a, you know, an older generation, you know, my parents never used the word diaspora. <laughs> you know, they're like, I'm Filipino, I'm Indian. Um, and you're Canadian. And they would say that to me. They're like, you're Canadian. Um, and simultaneously, that sometimes meant that you were detached from your cultural tradition. It could be a kind of quiet insult. Um, but growing up, there wasn't really a language for us, for me to understand the kind of like hyphenated sort of reality or the multi-positionality that I now embrace. So one of the things that, you know, the realities that, that I feel that we face is like, being within, um, you know, a Canadian context, being within like a European inheritance and being people of color um, and not seeing ourselves seen and not seeing our cultures represented. So I feel like it was in my 20s that uh, when I, after I left art school, that there was, you know, um, this kind of identity politics moment that was happening where uh, people were kind of like, fighting for their own space. They're like, okay, we're, we're like the South Asian crew and we're gonna like talk about South Asian things and we're going to promote our culture because actually if we don't put up these boundaries, we're just getting bulldozered by, uh, by this kind of like sterilizing um, blanket like white supremacist like narrative, right? Um, of what culture is and what culture is not. And so the word diaspora came to me around that right so i'm part of a diaspora like part so diaspora often means like somebody who's from uh from who's in another place but whose ancestors or origin is from another country right like so that's often how it, it works you african diasporas you have you know uh south asian diasporas you have lots of different kinds of diasporas but for me it was a bit tricky because a lot of the conversations around diaspora around then were really about longing for that homeland or you know this desire to go back there and for me in my generation and from my perspective i wasn't i didn't really feel incomplete i didn't really feel like i was less than i didn't really feel like i was either or 
I always kind of felt like I was like both end. And so for me, the diaspora word took a while for me to get comfortable with because the ways that identity politics in the, uh, in the 80s, 90s were being performed were very, very important, but at the same time could sometimes end up being a little bit like nationalism light for me. Like I had to now perform my, uh, my affinity in an overt way that didn't feel natural to me. Um, but as the, the years have gone by, I've come to my own relationship to the word diaspora, because for me, it, it really, like if you don't take it too seriously, <laughs> if you just think about it as a frame or as a lens or as a rubric, that really kind of underlines that every person has um, a number of different cultural affinities and affiliations, and that it's not about being authentically this or that, but really about, um, uh, I don't want to say a celebration, but it's really about like owning that we can come from multiple um, spaces uh, and own them simultaneously without being inauthentic that I feel is what's very useful to be about the term diaspora. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, well said. <laughs> <laughs> to be, no, to be, it's, a, it's a good answer. I think, um, and, and I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, growing up, uh, between cultures, right, or, or living sort of almost, you know, phasing in and out of cultures, depending upon where I was in the world, whether I was in the Philippines with family there, or I was in Vancouver, in East Vancouver, where I had, a, you know, I, kids from all over, diff all different backgrounds, everybody was second gen, um, you know, to, to, to working in the art world where the majority were, were white, you know, and, and then, but being able to kind of like code switch in some ways between those different worlds. And I think that, um, you know, we've talked about this in your work, that there is this kind of ability that, that, that you're exploring of, of switching perspectival views, right? And, and, and looking at the world through these different rubrics and, and seeing what comes of it, almost like passing your identity through um, you know, like a machine and then seeing or, or, or the subject and seeing what comes out the other end. Um, and I think, you know, I want to reference or begin with an early work of yours that it, that's at the beginning of this sort of cycle of images. And I should say to the audience, you know, we've decided just to kind of like cycle through these images so that you become familiar with the work. Some of them are um, by Jared and others are by artists um, or commissions that I that I worked on uh, with artists so that we could talk to different projects that we've done. Um, but Jared, I want to talk about the work Untitled um, 3, which um, is I think from 2009, I believe. Um, but it's this photograph of uh, sort of uh, you sort of like copying uh, this sort of turn of the century, the turn of the last century photograph of um, uh, the, the British monarch, the Nepalese prime minister and a, and, and a tiger were sort of standing over this murdered tiger. Um, but you yourself are, the, are, are in each of these positions and maybe you can talk about that work and with relationship to this idea of code switching and, and perception. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the piece is gonna be coming up soon uh, and it's, uh, it's from 2009 and around that time, um, I was in graduate school and in graduate school, as I mentioned before, I was like, I didn't really learn about um, artists of color that much. I didn't really learn about Filipino artists or, um, or Indian artists or, it, or most you know, artists of color. Maybe there were like three or four um, black artists, amazing artists who came and did talks, but for the most part, they weren't integrated into the curriculum. And so, as I was in graduate school thinking about um, if I'm a cultural producer, what culture do I make from? What culture do I make for as a person of mixed descent? How does this show up in my work? Like you know, this was like a, a deep and kind of like uh, troubling in a good way, like kind of question, series of questions I was asking myself. And so I ended up going to the library and trying to you know, find books to like teach myself, educate myself. Uh, and I found zero books on Filipino contemporary artists or Indian contemporary artists. And, but what I did find is this you know, book of colonial photographs of the British Raj. And so th this is the image that we're talking about right here. And it was, yes, as you said, of the, the King George uh, IV, who was actually crazily titled like the King Emperor. This is like, you know, colonial titles, right? Uh, and then the prime minister and 
of, of Nepal, and they had just done what, you know, powerful men of that age did, I guess. They went on a tiger hunt, you know. Uh, they killed rhinoceros, rhinoceri, all these different kinds of animals. And this was like something that they did. Uh, and as I was looking at this photograph in this book, feeling a bit um, like I was searching for myself, I, I just, I was like struck by this, I was struck by this image. I felt like it was like haunting me and it, and I had to make work to figure out what was happening. And so I re-performed this, um, this image uh, standing in as all three characters. And as I made the work, I kind of like got closer to what it was that I was um, feeling was that these colonial photographs really felt like a kind of science fiction to me, right? Like there's a, the colonial narrative is, is a kind of story that's being told of this other place, you know? Um, and that story becomes so grand and so powerful that, you know, it justifies, you know, invasions of different countries and the, the kinds of propaganda that they use uh, are uh, multifarious and many folds, right? And I was trying to understand this image, you know, being somebody who grew up in Toronto, didn't grow up in colonial times, didn't grow up here. So I kind of used myself as the, um, as like the filter. and. Part of what I discovered or um, came to was that I, I actually felt a lot like the colonizer in the image. Uh, I was getting this education in a, in, at Yale University at the time, extremely like, you know, neo-imperialist like uh, institution named after Eli Yale, who was an actual uh, member of the East India Trading Company, um, which was a capitalist arm of uh, the colonial involvement in, uh, in India. And then I was also simultaneously feeling like the colonized, uh, but mostly at that, that moment, I was feeling <laughs> like the dead tiger, like this real thing that was uh, like turned into a symbol. You know, I, I mean, it's a, a majestic, magnificent animal, but there's no more um, exotified orientalist like image than there is of a tiger, right? So uh, I try to use the photograph as a way to understand this relationship and it, it was useful for me in a way because it broke me out of the binary between like um, the colonizer and the colonized, right? It's like, a, it's kind of like a two, um, a, a two point um, line, right? This is like this node or that node. And what it did was it introduced like a third node. And so in my work, I think since then, I've been really thinking about um, the number three or about like, like three different kinds of nodes or three different kinds of works or spaces because when you have three nodes then it's not just like a ping between this or between that it's actually about the spaces in between that are also full of potential energy and it's those spaces in between like the spaces that are not mapped or that are unplotted or unarchived that I'm really interested in. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think I think just to speak to this idea of the the, the archive or, or what's missing, say, in the archive, the occlusions within the archive. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting that that you know you're 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 a person, you're an artist who I think is always interested or looking at different visualizing mediums, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, for me in my own work, I'm I've always been sort of fascinated and tried to interrogate this idea, the, the power of visualization and its relationship to, to uh, colonization, its relationship to um, oppression and surveillance, um, mm -hmm. and th this, this need to know, this need to, um, you know, to kind of shed light on everything um, and thereby um, know it and thereby own it or control it or categorize it. Um, and it, you know, and this is the, you know, since the enlightenment, this has been the kind of the, the, the mode, um, the, the terrorizing mode of, in which we live, right? And now, you know, greater and greater technologies of visualization just make more and more of the world known. Um, and, and there's less of these sort of dark spaces. Um, on the other side of that, there's also, um, you know, the, the, the people missing, right? The, the kind of the, 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 um, the occlusions within the within the kind of the known, right? So the the, the ones that don't get talked about, um, or don't seem to fit within 
um, these categories. Um, and so I think, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, notions of, of, of queer theory and kind of thinking about the ways in which, you know, queer theory can help uh, or gives us sort of ways of talking about, um, you know, the, the, the what, is, what is not the either or, you know, the non-binary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what sort of like slips through the cracks and, and doesn't, and is sort of slippery or is fugitive or is errant within these spaces of, of, of knowingness. Um, and I was hoping maybe you could talk about that in relationship to some of these other works that we're seeing. Uh, specifically, I think, you know, you've got, there's a lot of, there's a lot of images here where, where you, where you see these sort of like, um, well, here missing faces, missing bodies, but certainly there, you know, the, the chrome, uh, chronoma, which is an image that's coming up as well. You're kind of, it's kind of a, a um, you know, it's an image of, of yourself, but of course you can't see who you are. Are you a thing? Are you a being? So maybe talk a little bit about how that functions in your work, the sort of the darkness and the kind of the opacity within, the, within your work. Um, what is that for you and how do you, how do you use it? Yeah, I think that light is a big character in my work. Um, I feel like uh, omission, obfuscation, fragmentation, um, the shadows, they're all strategies that I implement, you know, um, uh, create, like, how do you tell a story with um, parts that are missing? <laughs> how do you speak in a language that doesn't have words for what you want to say, um, using the words that exist? So I feel like the, that third other thing, that space, that ghost is something I'm always trying to conjure, right? And so the, uh, what is uh, revealed through the light and what is hidden by the darkness is, uh, is always part of the conversation because you're always like, uh, uh, you know, you, when you take a photograph, you're always not taking a thousand other photographs in that given second, right? Um, and so that's something that I'm interested in uh, acknowledging as well, you know, is that representation feels like it gets us closer to a thing, but may not really. Right, it may create like a whole uh, universe, uh, you know, within the simulacra of it all that creates its own world that may be uh, affiliated but separate from reality and the reality that you know. And and this is a reality that we understand when we, from, who are not included in the archive, look into the archive to try to find ourselves, um, and we find that we are not there. So we kind of existed all the time, the whole time. Uh, in the shadows of, you know, the, the other thousand images that haven't been taken. But the Enlightenment project and sort of the, the idea of knowing um, is something I'm very, very invested in, right? Uh, because this underlying algorithm governs so much of the world that we live in, right? It's that um, knowledge is a beneficial thing. <laughs> uh, you know, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of information, uh, it is intrinsically uh, inherently related to uh, some kind of salvation or some trans transmutation. But if we look at the Enlightenment project uh, with the pursuit of knowledge came the, uh, the pursuit of conquest uh, and became, it, it also became um, synonymous with uh, a kind of fear of the darkness, <laughs> the fear of what we didn't know and the desire to know uh, also you know, was equated to the desire to govern and sort of the paternalistic uh, ideas implicit in um, knowing through a certain frame. Uh, and, you know, this became a whole, a whole kind of invisibly uh, powerful and problematic algorithm that is part of why we have we have this problem of invisibility because the Enlightenment Project basically invisibilized, destroyed other ways of seeing, infantilized them, turned them into like, like the narrative was that they were less valuable, that they were more savage and really kind of like held up its idea of objective reality as, um, as, the, as the way. And this is part of, you know, the kind of, language that I'm quoting, it's like the language of the factual, the, the sort of quiet language of the authoritative um, that has seeped in to our everyday. Um, 
And so when you when you ask the question about the uh, you know the darkness, I guess one of the ways I can also think about it in terms of you know coming out of the shadows or always being within the shadows. Uh, one particular kind of spotlight. I also think about like Rorschach tests, right? And Rorschach tests like are very have always been very influential to me um, as a, 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 originally as a painter. You know, I was always fascinated by these blobs, these kind of like uh, marks that we would look at that then would um, kind of reflect back to us what we were thinking and how we were thinking, right? Like, so we would look at a Rorschach test and, uh, you know, we would just sort of free associate in front of a therapist. The therapist would then kind of say, oh yeah, that's interesting. That's, you know, you, what you're seeing and how you're seeing kind of like gives me an, uh, uh, a sort of window into how you're thinking. And so I think about that Rorschach test as a, a, a potential strategy in art making, like to create work that's a question or to, to involve strategic omissions or to um, conjure uh, work instead of show work. Like how do you make work that um, is kind of around the subject that you're talking about so that it can actually come into being um, through these complicated kind of dynamics uh, through a constellation of different kinds of work. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, part of it does. I mean, I think I wanna, I wanna know what you mean by conjuring. I think that's a interesting use of a word. Yeah, I, I feel like, okay, so um, I feel like the, the uh, if we're gonna talk about people and we're gonna talk about histories or we're gonna talk about culture, right? If we look in the archive, it's not there. They're not represented or they're over, overly represented in problematic ways, right? So they were in the shadows the whole time, but they were there. So there's kind of ghosts that are lurking in the archive if you know how to read the archive. And so, um, thinking through how to talk about uh, how to talk about the things that are not talked about <laughs> is part of that conjuring that I'm talking about. Okay. It's like how to how to presence the absence, but mm -hmm. not just in that dynamic in terms of like a, a, like zero and one, but really talk about the the space that um, as being full of potential energy and that potential energy, referring to histories that uh, have been forgotten, realities that are existing in parallel and potential futures as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I think about like Sadia Hartman sort of, you know, narrating ghosts from the archive um, in, that, in that sense. But I, 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 find it, I find it sort of fascinating to think or challenging, right? I think, I think it's challenging for all of us who are interested in, um, you know, challenging these these regimes of knowing right but using the language of art which is low you know it, it, it is part of that colonial uh, oppressive you know enlightenment um knowledge system right we, everything we do every every the words we use the techniques we use these are a part of it right so so how then do you square that circle? How do you how do you get outside of the technologies that are wanting you to define, uh, to represent? You know, it, it, these are the technologies we have at hand, right? What what? How do you how do you navigate that yourself? That's a challenging question because I think it it really like um, happens in multiple ways, in multiple spaces, right? I, I feel like. Um, how do I navigate that? How do I navigate like the multiple? Can you maybe? Uh, I think it's so big, Tyrone. Could you ask me in a in a? <laughs> well, like I guess. Let me put it another way. So you know, it, you're we're making art. You're making art. I'm curating art, right? Right. The 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 the, the structures in which we represent this work, mm -hmm. whether it be galleries, museums, right? You no, know, I think we've seen. Um, you know, specific, you know, especially over the last year and a half, the challenges that I think a lot of people are facing operating within a system that yeah. is, 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 is 
systematically, I mean, the racism and the kind of occlusions, they're baked in, right, to the system right. itself, right? Okay. I, 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 I think I understand specific. Okay, great. Yeah. So, yeah. so I often um, call myself an artist, and then I use like a pipe to say artist and cultural producer. <laughs> and something about using the word cultural producer and not necessarily using the word artist uh, sometimes makes me feel a little freer to do things that aren't just conventionally understood as um, fine art or high art or related to like a specific lineage of, of history, which I'm also invested in in another way. I'm not just like born out of the matrix. Uh, I went to art schools. I'm like teaching in like, you know, I'm teaching in North America. I'm not like, you know, um, I'm not fully without, right? So the, the question is how to navigate from within and from without while being within, right? So I think there's a number of strategies that I've used in terms of uh, presenting my work um, and presenting my work, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to be outside of a system and outside of institutions. And that's really quite important in its important work and to work in parallel. Um, and then it's also important for me to also work within institutions and make change from within uh, to try to find ways to hack the system. And then like uh, once you have a little bit of space, you kind of like elbow a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then you like invite more people in and then you like, you know, you leverage your power and you and you you kind of uh, change the system from within. So for years, I've been working in nonprofit art galleries. Um, or artist run centers. Uh, and that for me has been a parallel way to work within normally culturally, uh, culturally supportive institutions, no, normally smaller spaces, uh, in order to create dialogues among cultural producers that are meaningful, that rep represent uh, the reality that I know and that, um, that I am uh, part of. And, and that has been something that has been really, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to save my life a million times, like having that community of like-minded individuals. So for years, for, you know, almost 20 years, I was working in nonprofits, you know, curating stuff, uh, organizing. Um, and I continue to do it, but more on an independent, um, you know, project sort of level. Another way that I try to do it is through, um, you know, I do Wikipedia edit-a-thons. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm trying to fix one of the, the biggest archives uh, on the planet right now that people have access to. It's one of the most trafficked websites, you know, after Google, right? It's Wikipedia. Uh, and there's a huge vacancy of um, writers and of articles about uh, underrepresented uh, cultural producers and activists. So every year I, uh, I organize edit-a-thons to do, you know, that kind of work. Uh, I try my very best to do this in the classroom um, by curating, uh, by curating artists into the curriculum that are just doing the, just exist and are just doing the work already. Not in a way of, it's not like the last chapter of a textbook, right? I'm not talking about like cultural inclusion. I'm actually really, interested in thinking about cultural production that's happened across the world throughout history um, and has happened like forever, you know? And so for me, the, the challenge of working uh, within institutions and uh, growing up in North America is that you're constantly trying to, to fix existing problems within the structure itself. And, you know, the, Canadian, you know, great Canadian thinker, Marshall McLuhan, the medium is a message. So if I plug and play into, you know, a white box gallery system that is uh, at its core, uh, uh, you know, ethno Eurocentric or eth ethnocentric or, you know, European focus or Western European focus, um, like how is my work gonna be seen in its, in its fullness? So I feel like, I feel like I'm not giving up that fight. <laughs> But I'm not waiting for, I'm not waiting for, for, <laughs> for daddy to tell me I did a good job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, it, it's, I get it. I understand the parameters and there's so many amazing things 
about um, presenting in larger institutions and larger spaces, which allows your work to reach greater audiences and, and it, they become a form of cultural capital that allow you to meet uh, more people. But I'm also really in, indebted and uh, in love and sort of uh, in community with other um, cultural producers who are trying to think their way into a future that we want to see or that we already know exists but aren't really seeing. So uh, I feel like this code shifting, shape shifting thing uh, is kind of working out in a way where you, where it's not all or nothing, you know, but I feel like, you know, coming from New York and we both lived in New York for a while, I feel like the, the market is really like a heavy, you know, thing there. And I feel like people often feel an extreme pressure to plug in because these are the systems that exist that if we don't have can end up um, really making life hard. So I've often tried to have a part-time job <laughs> or a, or a full-time job in parallel that is related to cultural production. Um, so I don't have to only rely on the capitalist networks uh, to, to help support me. Um, and I've, I've always been somebody who, uh, who tries to build community and has really honored and respected uh, the work and the labor that goes into the community builders around me. And, um, and I'm, I'm a function of all of these spaces, all of these like under commons, all of these parallel systems, all of these artist run, uh, you know, um, networks, all of these, uh, you know, uninstitutionalized networks, all these like black market economies <laughs> of art sharing and, um, and vision sharing and support. Uh, no, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think that that's exactly, um, you, you ended up where kind of I wanted you to end up, which was, uh, was thinking not just about sort of like politically uh, and in the, you know, in the world, how you act, but also how you operate within the art world um, and how how your how your work circulates, right? And I think and I think that there is well, you mentioned one one way that I was thinking about, which was this idea of like the undercommons and the kind of the the collective work and the kind of like creating space within and without of community with other artists of like minds um, that don't necessarily you know, respond to or feel the need to play into the market or, you know, into the kind of the, the, um, the power games that, that exist within the art world and the kind of, you know, the ways in which art circulates at, at certain levels. Um, but the other thing that I think is, I think is interesting in your work or I find interesting in your work is, is also this kind of, what I feel is a kind of um, commitment to a kind of anti-aesthetic, right? Or a kind of, um, uh, we've talked about a vernacular, right? Uh, sort of mm -hmm. the ways in which you draw on um, vernacular aesthetics um, and a kind of anti-aesthetic in the art world sense um, that, that I think is something that I have found um, operative, you know, not just in, in North America, but really like globally. Like I find it find so fascinating to see artists, you know, from South Asia, from the Middle East, um, from other parts of the world, who are finding ways of artic you know, of creating work from their own particular visual worlds, right? And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily make a hell, a hell of a lot of sense in the kind of Western art market structure. You know, you if you saw it in a at an art fair, it would just like look like you just would feel very out of place. And that excites me. That kind of that kind of feeling of like. I am looking at something that has a very different point of view and a very different, um, or it's drawing on a very different, another world, right? Another worlding, uh, a visual world. Um, and so that kind of brings me to the, a series of work that, that's also in here, um, which, you know, the, all that glitters is, is the title. And, and I think I'd love you to talk about these works and, and, and where these came from and how, how, you, how you see them fitting in, in this sort of larger constellation of works that you've created. Yeah, thanks for that. I, 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 um, I kinda, I, I'm looking forward to, to re-watching this later to hear all your observations. They're really, uh, they're really great. Um, 
but yeah, the all the glitter series start. I mean, it kind of started. It there were like all these different things that were floating, um, and they have been floating for a long time. And you know, the, the series it's called All That Glitters, um, and these are all my old shoes. Um, they're uh, shoes that I've worn. Um, I've worn out. Uh, I've they've fallen apart, and um, instead of just throwing them out. Um, I decided to sort of rescue them and trick them out. Uh, and one of the things that influenced, there's a few different uh, influences in the work. One of them was, uh, you know, uh, golden joinery, which is a Japanese sort of uh, art form uh, related to pottery, where uh, if, you know, um, a vessel is broken uh, or a cup is broken, uh, it's uh, put back together, but it's joined with gold. Um, and so that kind of uh, refers to a kind of reverence uh, in our scars or in the cracks or in like the living of life as opposed to like the ideal of what we should be. But really, this is where um, wisdom comes from. Uh, another big influence was uh, uh, Filipino gypneys. Um, and Filipino gypneys, if uh, anybody um, has been to the Philippines, are these will know exactly what I'm talking about. There are these uh, incredible, uh, you know, modes of transportation that used to be US military Jeeps uh, that were then um, after, you know, a large wave of the military left. Uh, these, these Jeeps then got re uh, sort of purchased or reimagined by Filipinos uh, as these really incredibly colorful, um, tricked out, blinged out um, modes of um, parallel transportation uh, that you know use you know you, you you pay somebody and you kind of go from one um, one part of the city to, to the other. Uh, and if you if you look it up, if you look up Filipino gypsies, you'll see these amazing like maximal um, artworks on wheels, you know, with just colors of every uh, you know every shade, every spectrum. Um, you know, with pictures of like baby Jesus and like somebody's name, somebody's daughter's name uh, with like four horns. So there was something in this repurposing and this maximal aesthetic and this aesthetic of just adding one more thing and then another thing and then another thing and then another thing when like to, to reveal like this, this, this other thing that's much more, um, alive and uh, vibrant than anything that I saw in art school, <laughs> you know, but it's considered, an, it's, not, it's not considered an art object, right? Because there's kind of like a top-down thinking in how we, you know, we think about making work. So there's, there's references to that. Um, and then there's also references to dollar store culture. Um, and I love dollar stores. Dollar stores are like uh, something that I remember from, you know, being young and like going around dollar stores, uh, walking around and, you know, if you walk around dollar stores, there's all these interesting aesthetics. There's like, uh, you know, bright neon green plastic things and, and uh, you know, pink uh, sort of like bright pink shirts with like, you know, crazy jewels everywhere. Um, there's lots of gold and camo, right? There's, there's like a whole kind of mashup aesthetic, you know, um, you know, from the dollar store that I really was thinking about. Uh, and the last sort of reference was like um, Flemington Park. And Flemington Park was a neighborhood that I grew up in, or at least started off in. Um, and I was reflecting uh, when I was making these work on my own, you know, background. A another like friend, colleague, artist said, you know, I, I'm really interested in seeing like, like, <laughs> where's the work that you make that's fr like, that's like where you're from, or like where, uh, like, like where's the where's the work from like your hood for your people, and there was something about the way he said it, which you know, of course, I'm not interested in the question where you're from, but that you know made me sort of think about uh, how I understand um, aesthetics and my cultural relationship. And I kind of, uh, you know, thought about dollar stores and I thought about Flemington Park, this like very, um, very uh, intensely transitory space 
that I, I grew up in that is kind of like a jump off point for um, immigrants coming into the country, like new immigrants came. Um, and there were people from all over the world that were there. So when I started to think about like how to make work, um, about like, you know, uh, about like where I was from and, you know, it wasn't actually like a one, two, three, honestly, it, it just kind of all, like all of the magnets sort of like attracted and then just kind of like, I just started making these works. Um, and then they sort of emerged and they were works that emerged <laughs> in this way where once I was done making them, I, I was like, are these art? Are they like what? They're, they were so personal to me. They were like so personal to me that I didn't even know like, okay, can I put these in a gallery? Like what, like how does this actually function? Like, you know, I, my art brain couldn't wrap its head around it. And I remember, and I was telling you this story before Tyrone that when I was installing them in Queens, uh, at the Queens Museum, um, like before I could even finish the installation, there were a bunch of you know people kind of like crowded around the work um, as I was installing it, and it was mostly it wasn't like normal gallery goers. It was like the people working at the gallery, <laughs> the people who were there like setting up an event um, later on, and they they were you know they just started sharing stories about the '80s and the '90s and how um, you know we used to paint on uh, our jean jackets or on our, our pants, or we used to trick things out, um, you know, to try to make do, like to try to um, try to still look fly, even if we were broke, you know? Um, so I think there's like something, there's something in there about like this kind of like bittersweet ilk of fabulousness that I, I feel relates to, um, like an aesthetic that I see in some uh, immigrant community still to this day, you know, when I'm uh, when I'm there. And so I kind of wanted to pay homage to this kind of work that I hadn't quite seen um, before that was coming from like my um, overlapping sort of perspectives. No, absolutely. And, you know, you, you said something uh, interesting uh, there. You said something like the, your art brain couldn't wrap your head around it. Yeah. And I think and I think that's that's the important key, right? Is that the art brain is telling you, wait a second, this doesn't, it's too personal, it's too much about where I'm from, it's too uh it's not art enough. Yeah. I think that I think you said that to me earlier on too, like it just didn't feel like it was art enough. Yeah. And I think and I think that's the thing, right? It's like these are the anti-aesthetics that I think art are, are because there's more of us now, like there's there's a heck of a lot more of us than there were when we were starting out right. in terms of people of color, um, you know, different identity, you know, identifying people making work that I think now we're no longer, I, I feel like there's an increasing um, acceptance or openness to creating very, not hermetic, but definitely coded work, right? That speaks to a particular audience and only to that audience. And that is okay, right? Like that's, like you don't need to, everyone doesn't need to get the work, right? Um, and I think that speaks to also this idea of community and, and like these, these, these spaces of the undercommons and these sort of, these spaces where we, we, we exist outside, like in the shadow, right? And, and not wanting to be, um, you know, noticed or, or, or celebrated or recognized maybe in, in, in that other way. Not to say that you don't want your work recognized as an artist, because of course you do, but I think but I think that that's I think that's a really interesting place to work from, right? Is where you're starting to make work that is very coded and very specific to a particular group of people. Um, but I think it, you know, and as you said, like at Queens, you just had this whole group of people coming up and just actually responding to the work in this other way that you didn't have maybe with some of your other work, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, right? absolutely. And I feel like this is yeah. You know th this whole thing about audience and like reaching a wider audience is a really covert and weird form of assimilation that can sometimes happen in art school or in art spaces, right? Um, so my desire is not to not communicate or not connect uh, with people. No, I, I want everybody to connect with my work, but I don't feel like I'm going to uh, twist myself into knots, trying to like um, over explain. Uh, 
the work to the point where the work becomes uh, banal and poetic. Uh, and this idea of thinking about audience and addressing audience is, it can be a trap, right? It can be a trap. So one of the ways that I, I um, wrestle or I have like sort of been thinking about audiences, um, I think about making work sometimes for like a younger version of myself. <laughs> or I think about making work for like five people in the world that I've had these very complicated, nuanced conversations with. Um, or I think about like making work for my generation of people who have similar kinds of experiences. And it's not that it needs to, the work needs to stay there. There's always ways you should invite people in or you can embed different kinds of doorways into the work. But really the main and most important audience uh, has to be like my people or has to be people who are willing to do the work and willing to, um, uh, to see outside of um, the way they maybe see and uh, can do the, the, the heavy lifting of, of experiencing outside of their comfort zone. And uh, this, this is a belief I have in people. <laughs> it's a belief I have that people want something more. And it's a belief in myself in a way that I, can, I should be a, like a better version of the, the weird idiosyncratic, strange like cacophony of like voices that, that uh, happen naturally without much, much effort. And, you know, to your point of like legibility in the art world, I feel like this was a very, very specific decision that I made, you know? Um, and ever since then, it's been, <laughs> it's, been, it's been harder to show my work in some spaces. It's been harder for my work to be legible to some um, curators, to some uh, ways of seeing because they want a kind of performance that they're used to. And I'm not interested in doing that because for me, it's really boring or like kindergarten to me, you know, like the sort of uh, easy tropes um, of representation are not quite what I'm after. And I think I would have to literally dumb, my, I would feel like I had to dumb myself down to, to connect with that wider audience. So I, I believe we should connect, but I also don't, I don't think it should be at the, um, the price of, of the work, you know, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that, uh, you know, I've just been thinking about, like, how you navigate through different systems. Um, and you kind of have to deal with the systems as they are, but you also have to, like, own your own space. And I think that's where, like, the idea of, like, double consciousness or shape shifting or code switching also comes in handy. You know, you uh, you can see in a number of artists, um, underrepresented artists from all times, uh, that there's often like multiple levels in their work, right? There's the level that is legible to uh, the wider audience, and that you know maybe uh, the curatorial, uh, you know, elite, like a certain kind of curatorial, um, a certain kind of curator. And then there are all there are different layers for people who are a little bit in the know. Things are coded, double coded. Um, you know, there are different ways that um, we can we can. Uh, hide narratives in plain sight as well. So that's something like, you know, uh, that I think, you know, as we're talking about diasporic aesthetics, I feel like that's something that often happens is you have like multiple registers to work and yeah. multiple significations happening at the same time. Yeah. You know, and, and especially if you're used to um, code switching and speaking in multiple tongues, um, I think your ability to create work and almost like, you know, do this sort of uh, you know, it's 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 a it's um it's skillful to be able to create work that works at multiple different levels, right? And sort of can be read, or there's multiple entry points um, depending upon your subject position. But I I think I think this 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 you know what I'm what I'm what I'm interested in in terms of diasporic aesthetics is just that, that is, is a sense that I feel like it's also about a kind of resistance to um, a, you know, a kind of expected aesthetic, right? And it, and it is mm. it is challenging for some. There's a kind of, not, a, not an ugliness, but a kind of like, ah, what am I looking at? And how do I read this? If I'm coming from an art position, I actually have to um, make, do the work. I need to, I need to learn about Jeepneys, right? I need to learn about this other stuff that 
wouldn't necessarily be in my wheelhouse uh, to draw from in terms of trying to understand this piece. Um, and I just wanted to, I mean, I, I told you I would do this because I just, you know, I, I love her work, but um, Kathy Park Hong's book, mm -hmm. book Minor Feelings, um, you know, as a poet who, who also writes in a kind of, you know, she talks about writing in bad, with, with bad English, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a kind of, at first she was sort of uncomfortable with this, but then eventually she started to see this as a, a, a way of like, of, of decentering whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. of, of just sort of in allowing her to feel the comfort that she does feel when she hears people speaking with bad English, because mm -hmm. I don't know about your mom, but my mom spoke, you know, speaks with bad English. And mm -hmm. there's a comfort to me when I also hear other people speak with that English, I'm like, I get, I, I you know, I kind of, I, I, I somehow understand it really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, she, she just goes, she says, um, if I'm going to re write nearby my Asian American condition, and by writing nearby, she's, she's quoting uh, Trinity Minha, the mm -hmm. idea of, of sort of, of making work nearby your subject. I feel compelled to write nearby other racial experiences Students have asked me, how do I write about racial identity without always reacting to whiteness? The automatic answer is tell your story. But this too can be a reaction to whiteness since white publishers want the Muslim experience or the black experience. Mm -hmm. They want ethnicity to be so siloed because it's easier to understand, easier to brand. And I would, I would add easier to control, right? And mm -hmm. separate and, and divide and control. Um, ever since I started writing, I was not just interested in telling my story but also in finding a form a way of speech that decentered whiteness. I settled on bad English because, as the artist Greg Bordowitz said about radical art, it bypasses social media algorithms and consumer demographics by bringing together groups who wouldn't normally be in the same room together. And I just, you know, so just thinking about about the ways in which, um, uh, you know, for her it's language, but for you it's a visual language, right? And we've talked, I think, well, you and I, and you've also written about this idea of a lexicon, right? That, that you're developing um, or you have been thinking about your work um, as a kind of lexicon. Um, and I think that that's, that's part of, again, this diasporic aesthetic, right? Because, there, because there's no uh, fixed place from which you come from or that you're working from, you almost have to provide and create your own uh, language, your, your own, your own um, syntax right your own your own lexicon around yourself and around your work in order for for others to to read or, or approach sorry am i over time maya <laughs> i see you <laughs> oh no 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 okay we're good um anyways maybe you could talk about this idea of the lexicon and how it functions in your work yeah the um you know th this this term the le lexicographer was actually um part of an essay that Swapna Tamane um, wrote about an exhibition that I was in. And I, I'm sometimes really, um, no, no, I'm always really uh, excited to read what people write or how people see my work. And this frame of thinking about my work um, in terms of uh, like as a lexicographer was really interesting to me. And it, it makes a lot of sense, but I hadn't quite put the word on it. Sometimes like, the thing is so close to you <laughs> that you don't actually like name it. Um, like, what, like I was talking to my friend one time and he said, uh, I said, what's my work about? He's like, your work is all about the alien. And I was like, oh, okay, wow, that's really great. And it was like very easy, uh, but it was, it, it helped me see my work from like a few degrees over, you know, and to look um, at it with new eyes and the lexicographer work, uh, the writing, uh, it was really like one of those writings for me as well. But I think the idea there that she was talking about and that I, I felt for a long time is that, you know, it's like, how do you speak in a language that doesn't have words for what you're saying, really? And um, how, do you, how do you use the, the master's tools to dismantle the master's house? Um, how do you, like, is that possible? You know, that's kind of the question where, uh, you know, the second question underneath the other thing we were talking about being part of the art world um, and so I think that this, I think this idea of like bad English is, I, I mean, I look at it from two different perspectives because I think it may be considered bad from somebody else's perspective, right? With, when they have this idea of like the sacred English and then this is the bad English. 
but mostly people speak English with the same grammar or syntax of their mother tongue, right? Um, and then, so there's, there's a, a way of thinking that's embedded in language, right? Like that's the sapir whorf hypothesis that language influences how we see and culture and language are uh, interchanged. So there's something about the way that my mother configures English that feels like home to me, right? Uh, and I don't know like how exactly that functions, you know, cognitively, but I do feel that it makes sense to me on one level. And, and the whole conversation about like bad English um, is really is really about owning your English or owning your hyphenation or owning like your own quixotic mind. And I, I was you know reminded of Toni Morrison in this interview talking about you know uh, a moment of freedom that she had when she first started writing for uh, herself and her community that was um, liberating. And there is this question, you know, that that people of color are often asked, which is, um, like, when are you going to make work uh, to communicate with the the wider audience? And it's a very uh, manipulative and problematic question because really, what it in that case, wider audience normally means whiter audience, right? And so I'm completely fine to connect, and I want to connect. It's not about exclusion. But it's not that it's not at the expense of my subjectivity and my um, quixotic, uh, hopefully aspirationally poetic combination of, of of things that make me me, and that I feel connect really well with people who know kind of what I'm talking about, and and there's a lot of people who know what I'm talking about, like across different cultures across different generations, across different, um, you know, people that, that uh, are part of different communities that think about themselves as both and, and are not either or. So I feel that, you know, in losing some of that wider audience, I really gain a deeper connection with people who have been really starving in a way to see work that reflects our reality. Right, and uh, I've had this experience before where uh, I well up, I get very e like emotional when I see something that's written from a perspective that's like mine, um, because then I realize, oh, I've been living this whole time without that, you know, without this reality. Oh my gosh, you know, there can be like, like uh, a handsome leading man that's Asian in a film, like, but oh yeah, I haven't, you know, there, there's ways that that representation really matters. You know, um, in, in you have to try as much as possible to come to it on your own terms and not just play the play the normal sort of reindeer games, you know. Have you seen The Green Knight? The Green Knight? No, yeah. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, movie with a South Asian lead. Um, so I think um, what I understand from the chat is that we should be opening up to questions from the audience. So I don't know how my you want us to do that. Should we just read it out and answer? Sorry, I missed I missed that part of the pep talk. I'm I'm pressing all the wrong buttons at the right times and the right buttons at the wrong times. So um this is maybe just a suggestion to talk with some of the questions because I feel as though uh, Jared and Tyrone, you, you're, you know, enveloping your conversation with such beautiful language. I don't want it to be sidetracked by like, now we start the question and answer. Um, and I, I feel as though there's some questions coming in the Q&A as well as in the chat that are responding to things you've already been talking about. So maybe it's not a switch to Q&A, it's to continue with the Q&A. Uh, okay. And there, I'm, I'm going to help with lining them up because they're coming in different spaces um, but there's one in the chat that was just directed towards the hosts and panelists um tyrone do you see the question from swapna yes hi swapna um in relation to diaspora aesthetics multiple selves navigating several space um 
and being part of a diaspora, I often find that I have no I have to provide a preface to preface even when wanting to embrace capacities. Can you talk? Sorry, I, I don't know if you can speak on this, but can you talk more about what you mean by preface, as in like prefacing where you're from? I'll also add in parentheses, Swapna, if you wish to speak, um, just merely raise your hand and Alexandre, who is our tech, can, can help you so we can hear your voice, which would be great. That also goes for others in the room. Great. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Hi, hi, Tyrone. Hi, Jared. Um, hi, Maya. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm articulating my question as I was, as I was kind of typing it. Um, while listening to both of you kind of um, speak about these ideas of wanting audiences to do the work. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, I do find that a preface to a preface is required in order to understand context or materiality or, um, you know, symbols that might come up or sort of in thinking about diaspora, diasporic aesthetics and all the things that one is sort of drawing from that inform us. Um, and in that kind of navigation of like domestic spaces to external spaces um, and being able to, you know, fluidly move between them. But then in, in speaking about your work and I often find this with, um, you know, we are, we are mostly primarily dealing with white spaces and white institutions. Um, there's the need to explain oneself. And so I wonder how do we, you know, there is sort of Guisson's opacity that I'm, you know, very much interested in, but how do you um, engage viewers while retaining opacity while also, you know, not wanting to explain yourself, but having to explain yourself? That's a very complex question. And um, I mean, a lot of what you've spoken about has kind of addressed it, but I, I'm, I'm curious about this idea of like, you know, having to preface yourself. Tyrone, are you? Uh, who should answer? Who would you like to answer, Swapna? I mean, both of you, really. I think that. Yeah. Both Great, both Tyrone. Do you want to start? <laughs> I feel like I was I was talking a lot more. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, I think yeah. I mean, I, I I get what you mean, and I think that in terms of you know, as a curator, right, where you know, I often I'm not a I'm not a curator that likes to put myself um, sort of forward, right, in terms of, like, I kind of find, I have a very, I sit very uncomfortably with that kind of ego position. So in terms of, like, my own positionality, I tend to kind of, like, leave it, you know, silent and sort of, it's for those who know and, and for those, you know, for those who, who want to know. Um, I think that the, 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 in terms of the work and in terms of, like, showing work, like, say, Jarrett's or other artists who, whose work maybe is, more um, opaque or is somehow, you know, creating, you know, worlds of their own um, that, and I think, you know, one of some of the artists here that I'm showing, um, I would think specifically um, Rockne Raman and, and, and Hesam, um, who are, you know, a trio of art, Iranian artists um, who live in exile in Dubai and who are queer and who make work um, collectively and, and create work in a kind of very kind of um, kinetic salon style, um, co collective and relational way of working. It's very coded and in, in a way it's very hermetic because all of this, all of these symbols and imagery and, and, and images that they create um, are very much part of an internal dialogue that they have with you know, a very close knit group of, of friends and other artists. Um, I find what I like to find within this type of work is also a, a kind of playfulness or a kind of visual extravagance, and I think this is maybe why I'm kind of also taught, you know, connect, you know, drawn to to uh, Jarrett's uh, shoes, right? Because I feel like with that you have a kind of like lure, right? So it, there is this kind of like, um, uh, yeah, I think I rely on 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 that sort of duality of a kind of like very hurt hermetic uh, internal um, uh, uh, dialogue and, and sort of creation of meaning happening behind the scenes. But on the, out, on the outside, there's this kind of playful, inviting seductiveness 
Um, I think that is a really good combination to have when making this kind of work. Um, so I find that that I, I kind of work with artists who, or I try to work with artists who 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 play up that that duality. And I find that that's that's a anyways that's that's one way of doing it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of one of the things I that came to mind. I I mean when I, when you were talking, Tyrone, I was also thinking about um, iron hands in velvet gloves, um, or a quote that you know poetry can sometimes. Um, communicate before it's understood, you know, or like the velvet, the velvet glove or the, mm. the, the seduction, uh, the materiality, like the art object actually can pull people in, in very um, unique ways, right? Uh, and, and that can actually get people to places they didn't think they could go to, or maybe they wouldn't have gone to if you just like told them where they were coming straight up, right? I think this is one of the powers of art. There's a lot of, um, you know, writing can do this. Sometimes comedy can do this. There's all these different ways you can bring somebody else through, uh, through the work. But with Swapna's question, I think it's like relating to something else too, which is about signification that doesn't come uh, from, like it's not within common knowledge within like uh, most curatorial circles or most uh, art historical circles. Um, and how do you address um, the context of your work without being overly determined by, um, by those? Uh, so basically, uh, you know, when you're a, a person from, from outside of a cultural space, if you explain too much, your work is not poetic anymore. Your art becomes an artifact, right? And so as an artifact, it becomes dead in this other way. But once you explain it too much, the sort of magic of the, uh, the unfolding can sometimes be um, lost, right? Uh, there's a quote in Il Postino, the movie about Pablo Neruda, where you know, they ask him you know, to explain his poem. And he says, if I explain it in any other words than are written, uh, it will make it banal, right? So I think that Swapna's you know, question about context is really, uh, something I face a lot, you know, how much do you give? How much do you not give? Like context is really important, but, mm. but when you give it, sometimes what you do is uh, people cannot unsee it and they only see the difference, right? So this becomes quite challenging, um, especially if you're working with, um, you know, a, a very loaded history that's not uh, visible or legible in this context. And you're working mostly with uh, people who are judging your work from this context. And I feel like that's one of the diasporic um, challenges that we have to sort of face and navigate. So one thing I do is sometimes I embed my titles with some kind of frame. Um, you know, sometimes I will uh, <laughs> write in ways that tell you <laughs> how I'm looking at the work, uh, but I won't be 100% like do this. It'll be a little bit more elliptical, or I will like uh, put put a work that is feels more easily legible beside another work that feels more um, nuanced and opaque. So for me, that's been one of the strategies, Swapna, that I've been been trying to do actively to deal with this is to like come from the same subject from multiple perspectives and have different kinds of entry points in, but. But I think it is a real, it's a real challenge because sometimes the context is really important. And if you explain it, it flattens the work, but it's necessary, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like more, the more scholarship that surrounds an artist or the more uh, knowledge that uh, this generation of curators has, like, you know, and, and if they can use that knowledge and like try to figure out how to strategize, like these, these problems that we've all been having and hopefully the next generation of curators and teachers can also like go a little bit deeper into like these structural questions. I think um, that might be like, we might have to wait a little bit or something. I don't know, <laughs> but I feel, I feel the same. I feel the same kind of pressures and stresses about how much is too much and how much is too little. And I feel like that's from without and not from within, you know? I would also, I also would want to add to that, that one of the, one of the great outcomes that I found of the, 
the, um, well, one of the great outcomes is sort of hard to say, but the, of COVID, right, and the lockdowns and the kind of, um, the amount of learning that has happened um, within sort of micro communities online, you know, sharing reading lists and, and sort of creating working groups and, and reading and, you know, reading groups and things like that, uh, doing workshops. Um, and all of the ones that I've attended have been actually about these sort of like, you know, other modernities, right, and other kinds mm -hmm. of uh, histories. Um, so I think there's, I, I, you know, I'm really hopeful that I, that I feel like there's, a, there's this increasing um, ability and numbers out there that are just churning and creating these, these, these other alternative histories for, for each other and for those who are seeking it out. I think the ground is ripe for it, right? Yeah. I mean, we didn't have these kinds, of, we didn't have the language that we have today. We're still catching up. But you know, when I was in school, we didn't we didn't use the word intersectionality. We didn't have the word decolonial within, you know, the main lexicon. We didn't uh, talk about fragility. We didn't talk about mansplaining, or we didn't have like like microaggressions. Like there's all these great words that have entered into our lexicon that that help us navigate, you know, some of these things, and hopefully will just keep on helping us um, navigate into the future. Uh, is are there Tyrone? Are there any other artists that you wanted? You know, any other of uh, the other works that you want to highlight? Uh, you know, because there's such incredible works that you've curated, um, and you know, we've been talking about my work a lot. But you know, you're a, of course you're a cultural producer yourself, and you're you're also using your um, you know your your position to uh, shine a light on artists that are having specific conversations. So I'd love to hear maybe about one or two of the, the works that you're also uh, have in, in, on rotation too, if that's okay. Sure. Um, no, I, and you know, and, and, and I, I really appreciated the opportunity to kind of like add, you know, work uh, of my own or artists that I've worked with, um, because I think, you know, the ones that I chose, I find are, are in real dialogue, I think with, with, with you and with what you're doing. Um, and here, you know, this, th these images, uh, this one and the next one, uh, a work by Hera Bouik Stashin, who's a, a, a Turkish artist, but she's, well, she's based in Istanbul, um, but she's of Armenian and Greek descent. And she, um, you know, it, it lives in this city that has erased um, her, you know, her own cultural identity. So she's very much attuned to the ways in which cities and um, architecture um, can hold these ghosts, right? And so I think she's doing this thing that you were talking about of conjuring the ghosts of, 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 of the city that she, that she lives in. And then also, you know, moving more, um, you know, as she works in various different parts of the world, um, also applying that strategy to the way in which she thinks about place and, and belonging and identity. And one of her, her the last couple of years, she's been deeply invested in um, her own, um, her own familial sort of like, you know, kinships. And, and she's looking actually at um, her ancestors, some of whom um, were, were, were sick and actually came uh, into um, the uh, Turkey from, from um, uh, you know, from, from, the, from South Asia, from the South Asia, from the subcontinent. And she's done all this research and, and is thinking about the ways in which she has maybe like different affinities um, and thinking about the ways that the, you know, uh, Punjabi history as well mm -hmm. um, has been erased uh, in certain parts of the world and the way in which when she came to Canada thinking about where in the city where in Toronto does mm. this community um, you know sit and so we actually spent quite a bit of time in Brampton mm. um, and we actually you know we did some really interesting work of like and this is part of the work that I love right I, I love um, about, you know, when thinking about diasporic artists and diasporic art, I love these sort of like crazy affinities that you can find mm. uh, between um, cultural positions. Um, and so she, she found uh, a kind of like mind in this uh, poet and artist named Kirat Kaur, um, mm. who's a beautiful, uh, you know, musician and poet and, and artist. Um, and we were able to, to, to do a, a kind of performance within her work, uh, the Kirat, um, uh, did for us. Um, and, and the conversation that followed was just this like really interesting, um, you know, connecting of people from very different positions, but identifying with this idea of erasure. Um, mm. And 
and that that to me i think is is you know like that is why we do this work is to kind of like help make these connections for artists and for um for others um and it, it certainly you know was was for me part of why a part of the ideas too between of the toronto biennial in 2019 and in this sort of sister edition in 2022 was how do we bring um how do we create a biennial which is you know you know by definition kind of you know international roster of artists um in a moment in time when you know we're, we're seeing a kind of a, a return to a kind of identity politics right of a kind of uh hunkering down and a kind of increasing levels of division and a kind of you know you know don't speak for me and of, of course there's this kind of um mm. positioning right and i think that the powers that be and and you know the neoliberal um globalized world that we live in loves it right it, it, it right. loves to see us all divided and and not talking to one another and not being able to communicate and share um so i think that that was really part of what we wanted to sort of find was to how how can we how can we foster um and encourage these kind of intercultural uh and intersectional dialogue right so so yeah so i, I, I mean that's one project there i don't want to go too far into the others but um i got to talk about rockney as well but yeah, so for me, I think I think that your your work is definitely part of this sort of more global, and it's you know you you make work from a very particular uh, triple position, you know, or quadruple position. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that 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 kind of um, ability to phase in and out of different positions is something that you share with a lot of people who who operate within diasporas. Right, and I feel it's a it, there is I can see that generational thing as well. Like I feel like I don't mm -hmm. know if it's it's just my generation. I, I feel it in in different work by people who've come before and people who are younger as well. But I feel there's something very uh, very particular about like the time we grew up, uh, the influences that we had, the readings that we had, our the influence of identity politics, and now this like this moment with like woke politics and and um and then also like the social movements that are really important that we need to like you know come towards but also like the need for complex and nuanced conversation right is is really important because cancel culture is really challenging but calling people out is really important and you know we need to we need to like dismantle um you know, some of the white supremacist structures that are, uh, you know, sort of keeping us uh, in boxes uh, while also not being colonized by those very same boxes, you know, in our struggle to uh, towards a, a kind of emancipation. So I feel like this idea you're talking about, Tyrone, like with, with about thinking about affinities across time and cultures and spaces and generations is like, is a way out, like is like an important, structural framing that I think um, kind of helps us move forward together as opposed to like fighting um, like in the oppression Olympics or like crabs in a barrel for like one seat yeah. at a table that is not even our table. So I think that's a that's a really important strategy that you, you brought up. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think art is 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 particularly uniquely in a place to be able to be a, to be a kind of field in which this can happen. Mm -hmm. um i i was recently doing you know I'm, I'm trying to write collectively for the catalog for the biennial which mm -hmm. is very difficult but yeah. um but um but you know we we've been we did a workshop with a number of different collectives in order to do that and one of the one of the people who led it was ca conrad the, the the poet and they uh said something you know like they think a lot about um correspondences rather than connections which i think is a really mm -hmm. important distinction um mm -hmm. and that of course you know feeds into poetry and it's sort of it's this idea that you know we don't need to make explicit our, our connections right it's, it's again this idea of like uh the, we hold we hold each other to account but we also respect each other's difference and and understanding that we can work side by side but we don't have to work you know i don't have to you know be in your place you don't have to be in mine we can work side by side um and I think that that's a really important lesson because, again, yeah, you're right. Calling people out for it, it is necessary, but canceling and sort of just not 
not recognizing that we work in communion and in community and that we that we need other people is is wrong-headed it's completely wrong-headed i totally agree maya how are we doing we do <laughs> uh, I, I've been, you know, picking my moment of not wanting to insert to say that it is after six, we're a few minutes past, uh, but I've taken a screenshot of a few questions that we didn't get to so they can still, you know, come to your, your attention. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to paraphrase so that they are also in the ether, um, there was a question in the chat about, um, I guess, the, the tactical use of ambivalence and how that perhaps is also tied to like choosing your moment of the extent of the explanatory comma um, mm -hmm. of how much there is a translation and explanation. And mm -hmm. an anonymous attendee uh, was asking if there was a specific time where you could cite that kind of uh, decision was, was enacted where you were, there was a kind of a protection um, put up there. And it's also extended with different language from, from Faber who's asking, for more language around this idea of a wider, wider audience. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to read his language. Thanks for this, Faber. Um, he writes, I find it comes from a space where it is assumed that diasporic communities have some kind of innate knowledge and not that a lot of this comes from research and self-education. Mm -hmm. And I'm always puzzled why some people feel that it is something they simply can't or won't understand. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the final question is from Maria, um, also a, a Concordia grad student, who is curious about the selection process of, of, of materials. This strikes me as a, an IMCA question, working across <laughs> media. Like, what is, what is the object that helps tell the story? And I know, Jared, in, in, in some of your writing, you also refer to the impossible object. Mm -hmm. So that's almost like a buffet for an invitation for further conversation. I think we need to we need to have a seek a redux redux <laughs> where we we invite you to to both come back or continue this in some some capacity. But if there was anything from that verbal buffet um, that you want to end off on, I would love to end on your words rather rather than than mine. And Jared, I'd love to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, Tyrone, I've been talking too much. Um, I think that, you know, the, we were talking about registers before, and we were talking about um, code switching. Uh, I think ambivalence is another really important um, strategy that I think is useful to think about, not in conventional ways. Uh, ambivalence is often thought of as uh, an, indec an indecisive moment between two um, choices where you're kind of at a halfway point and we just have to figure out like how to solve the problem. It's very capitalist. Um, and for me, what, I, what I'm interested in is like this idea of ambivalence as being like uh, a state of uh, being, uh, a state of being that we're all in and something that shouldn't be um, uh, overlooked and dismissed as a weakness, but actually like ways that we can find strength through that kind of multi-positionality. And I think uh, Louise Bourgeois said like, ambiguity is something that happens in your head, but ambivalence is something that happens kind of in your chest. And so I feel like having, mm -hmm. um, uh, like kind of owning that we are all ambivalent humans uh, and we're all multivalent humans, uh, that we all enact different performances at different times is really uh, important strategy in navigating all of this. I feel like the, the buffet was was a full buffet, and I feel like we could easily talk for another hour um, yeah. about all of it. And so my deep and sincere apologies for talking more and not listening more <laughs> when I when we could have been like answering some of these questions within the, the time frame. Uh, well, I mean, it's uh, I think an indication of there being a lot of moments that those who've joined us this afternoon, evening now want to continue to think about. So that's that's a kudos to both of you. Thank you so much for the rich conversation. And it went by so fast, another sign of, of, uh, of a rich time. Um, but I'd like to also thank everyone who came um, and asked questions, held space with us and listened. Um, also to Alexandre for uh, being the, ta the tech backup behind the scenes. And of course, again, thanks uh, Jared and Tyrone for spending time with us this afternoon. It was a real pleasure. Hope to do it again soon in some capacity. Thank you so much, Maya. And thanks to everybody for, for 
sharing your Thursday afternoon.